Ah, the joys of school again. Sometimes you learn about history, sometimes you learn how to not make history, and sometimes history comes straight to you. You took everything from me. I don't even know who you are. In fact, the man we're about to talk about is a big reason why this is in your likely future. That is if you don't stay in school. Tonight, for the first time in uh, 27 years, the United States has again started a draft lottery. I have asked the commanding general, General Westmoreland, what more he needs, and we will meet his needs. Once the communists know that a violent solution is impossible, then a peaceful solution is inevitable. The speaker here is Lyndon Baines Johnson, and today he stands as the most powerful man on earth a title he would shortly relinquish in only a few very painful well, years. It seems now more certain than ever that the bloody experience of Vietnam is to end in a stalemate. Despite his awe-inspiring power at his peak, only 17 years prior, Lyndon Johnson was on the verge of losing the Senate seat that would be his path to posterity. As history unfolded, landslide Lyndon would win the most important race of his life in one of the most contentious elections in American history. The main contention? A box of ballots from District 13. The infamous Box 13 case. So I think it's very clear what happened in, in, in that box. And that is? That is, the box was stuffed. <laughs> <laughs> We must be the great arsenal of democracy. For us, this is an emergency as serious as war itself. The year is 1941. The arsenal of democracy booms across the nation. A young upstart from Stonewall, Texas, branding himself as a New Deal Democrat is becoming a close friend to Washington insiders in the prevailing administration. He is even blessed to have a photographed handshake with the president, a campaign icon that he would immediately put to use in the special seat he would be vying for in the same year. His opponent, Wilbert Leo Daniel, and here's a uh, W. Leo Daniel, he's uh, Pat Leo Daniel, a flower salesman and a radio host who admitted he knew nothing of politics or governing, said that he only ran on a whim after asking his radio audience if he should do it. His campaign headquarters consisted of his three children, a sound truck, and small barrels of flour. With the might of his midday radio program, Mr. Pappy O'Daniel would end Johnson's early hopes of being in the Senate by a 1,311 vote margin. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know when when someone cuts you off in traffic and you just have to hop out the whip and end their whole shit? <laughs> in all honesty, Johnson felt he had been cheated in 1941. And despite himself breaking election laws to his favor, he knew the next time he played that the results would be on his terms. Seven years pass and once again there's a vacancy to represent Texas in the National Senate. There, we had three main contenders. George Petty, a World War I and World War II veteran who campaigned heavily on foreign policy issues and Cold War preparedness, his name to fame was running against his own party in 1922 when they nominated a KKK-backed candidate. Representing independent Democrats and Republicans, Petty ran as a write-in candidate, netting a third of the vote. Holy shit! Next up we have Lyndon Baines Johnson, a New Deal Democrat and famed loser in the 1941 election. According to the latest polls, he's sitting at 18%, and we'll be talking a lot more about him, but let's just say that he's a long shot from victory. And last but definitely not least, highly beloved statesman Coke Stevenson with the record as the longest serving governor in Texan history, while overseeing the state's recovery from the Great Depression and her role in World War II. He would be self-taught in law and enter the trade in 1914, prosecuting local thieves and hucksters. As a stoic man, Stevenson was not one to exaggerate his own abilities nor insist on his own importance. The most intimidating thing about Stevenson was that he was not full of himself. In 1947, after nearly two decades of public service, an interviewer asked Stevenson what his greatest decision as governor had been. Stevenson replied, Never had any. A living legend of a man who came from nothing, made it good, and then made it better for those around him. Stevenson had a moniker of Mr. Texas. It appears that Stevenson was not in bad company as a February 1948 poll showed Johnson at a measly 18% showed Stevenson at 64%. Looking at those numbers, Johnson would require the political equivalent of an 80s movie redemption arc to have a shot at winning. 
On May 22, 1948, long boy Lyndon Johnson would officially announce his candidacy for the Senate. Unfortunately for his campaign, Johnson would spend most of his first week staving off death instead of distractors. He would be hospitalized with a 104 degree fever and stay infirmed with kidney stones until July 4th. While in the hospital, Johnson had plenty of free time to listen to Coke Stevenson's famous statewide radio addresses from Tyler County. In those broadcasts, Stevenson would warn against a policy of fear spreading across the United States. Specifically, he blasted national politicians exploiting Cold War fears to increase government centralization. In following the news and triangulating against his opponent, Johnson became more hawkish in foreign policy. In a March 25th speech from Austin, Johnson urged war preparedness and more aggressive pursuance of selective service, saying, Unless young men are trained, panic and hysteria should rule Washington. These are the stakes to make a world in which all of God's children can live or to go into the dark. We must either love each other or we must die. After the next few months, there would be no love lost between the Johnson and Stevenson camps. While some politicians prefer to treat politics as a gentlemanly game of garnering the people's will through ideas and philosophy, others simply view it as a popularity contest with no rules. In trying to win that popularity contest, Johnson would revolutionize American politics by being one of the first American politicians to use helicopter campaigning to great success. Johnson would spend grueling campaign days flying from rurality to rurality, stopping between 13 to 30 times a day to shake hands with awestruck farmers. Observers in Townsville who had only seen helicopters and newsreels, or never at all, would call it the Johnson City Windmill, or Flying Windmill. He would get off his helicopter, ask the crowd for a pipe to impersonate his main opponent. In a mocking tone, LBJ would say, with one eye on the labor bosses in Fort Worth and one eye on the millionaires in Houston, he sits and smokes. Then Johnson would turn around and declare, I'm for states' rights. The performance clearly implied that Stevenson was two-faced and his folksy appeal betrayed his greedy nature. In line with their boisterous figurehead, the Johnson ground campaign would perfect the art of lying. The social engineering techniques were sophisticated yet simple. They would employ rumor mongers for $25 to $50 a day to go into local establishments to plant gossip about Stevenson's positions on a variety of political topics. Old age pensions, labor rights, Stevenson's judiciary record. Whatever positions antithetical to the crowd's politics would immediately be cast as Stevenson's wholehearted view. A common tactic would be buying a round of beer for the entire bar and then badmouthing Stevenson while the bar's attention was ripe. Johnson even produced a fake newspaper called the Johnson Journal and mailed it out to 340,000 rural mailboxes. The print was designed to mimic the small weekly newspapers common in the rural Texas countryside. The contents of the paper included bombastic and provocative headlines steeped in very little factual basis, such as Communist for Coke. By their professional look in association with other countryside newspapers, the Johnson Journal had a noticeable sway in rural counties. Whether it was on print, on the radio, or outside the helicopter, the Johnson campaign's rumor machine was running on all cylinders. Stevenson was being hit from all angles with accusations, most of which were completely made of whole cloth. If you believe the headlines, Stevenson was somehow in the pocket of both big labor and big business. The Johnson camp asserted that Stevenson was receiving camouflage campaign donations from phony oil rigging contracts on his ranch. These contracts had to be phony because, according to a source used by the New Republic, the notion that an oil company might drill on Stevenson's land is ludicrous. That was the worst oil prospecting land in the world. The Johnson campaign drummed up these allegations to the point where hard proof was unnecessary. It was common knowledge. Or at least it shouldn't be surprising that Stevenson was a typical Southern politician. A posthumous review of these corruption claims done by Robert Caro, Lyndon Johnson's chief biographer, exposed the bogusness of those assertions. Caro actually did find a small drilling site on Stevenson's property and discovered that for a man who dominated Texas politics for nearly two decades, Cowboy Coke was not a man of great means. His lifetime annual income never surpassed $13,000, and during his years of public service, he never made more than $5,000. This was an astoundingly low take for a guy who supposedly always keeps an eye on the millionaires on Houston. But never mind the petty politics, we all bend the truth sometimes, right? After all, this is a campaign and it's all about exposure, so how did Johnson fund his campaign? Johnson had longtime friends by the name of Brown and Root. Brown and Root were government contractors who had a reciprocal relationship with Austin politicians. Once Johnson rose to power in the 10th district, he worked tirelessly to secure his buddies a contract at the Marshall Ford Dam worth several million dollars. Being a real good friend, Johnson ups the ante by awarding Brown and Root a $100 million contract. 
Brown and Root had no real claim to such a huge contract besides being good friends with Johnson, and Johnson being a key supporter of Roosevelt. Based purely on Johnson's recommendation, President Roosevelt personally signed the first cost plus fixed fee contract on June 13, 1940. A cost plus contract is one in which the contractor is paid for all its allowed expenses plus additional payment to allow for a profit. Needless to say, Roosevelt and the Johnson campaign would never be short on funds again. The strategies used by Brown and Root in getting around campaign finance laws included forcing subcontractors to contribute or by giving fake fees and bonuses to executives with the expectation of it being funneled to the Johnson campaign. At one of the company's Christmas meetings, the spirit of giving was in the air as executives were showered with exorbitant bonuses. Four vice presidents were given $133,000 and the treasurer was paid $17,000. These bonuses were given in cash and transferred to the Johnson campaign in the same form. The unwritten rule was to keep no paper trail and to maintain that cash donations were primarily anonymous contributors. After an investigation of campaign finance law violations in 1941, BNR was fined a hefty $337,000. While onerous, the calculus to indulge Johnson's campaign remained firmly intact. Without Johnson's influence in the Senate, Brown and Root's future would end with an ignominious flash. Looking outside the purview of this election, the symbiotic relationship between Brown and Root and Johnson meant the meteoric rise of the latter would mean good fortune for the former. Today, Brown and Root has blossomed to a multi-billion dollar government contracting firm by the name of KBR. Looks like at least one candidate was keeping an eye out for the millionaires in Houston. And so it was, LBJ completely trounced his competition in exposure. You couldn't escape seeing the FDR LBJ handshake photo, hundreds of radio addresses and commercials ads in the weekly paper and daily news, Johnson was a household name, a household name that would morph into a local legend when he himself would pull into town off a flying windmill and offer $175 cash giveaways in the town center. Stevenson, a stoic and withdrawn man, is unaccustomed to the intense mudslinging the Johnson campaign is engaging in. His campaigning style relied heavily on citing his governing record rather than attacking his opponent. In terms of voter outreach, Stevenson would drive his old Plymouth across the Texas countryside, only buying $5 worth of gasoline at each station so he would have a reason to enter many gas stations to shake hands. After seeing Johnson's fancy toys, Stevenson supporters suggested he get an airplane for campaigning. Stevenson flatly refused. On other occasions, his supporters would suggest a musical presentation to accompany speeches, but again he refused, saying he would not prostitute himself to a sideshow to get elected to public office. The Dallas Morning News, in covering Stevenson's inoffensive and grounded campaign style, said that the ex-governor had always made it his policy to avoid making any statements designed to stir up hatred, fear, personal animosity, or uneasiness among the people. In personally responding to the claims against him, Stevenson responds, It would be out of my character for me to reply in kind. I need no defense, as my private life is an open book. I am running on my record and merit and not on somebody else's demerits. If my record of public accomplishments does not warrant my election to the Senate, then I ought to stay home. The people know how to make their choice. So what was Stevenson's record? Well, he arrived in office with a $35 million state debt only to see a surplus of $35 million once he left office. Teacher salaries were increased, pensions were bolstered, and infrastructure programs to help get farmers' produce on the road were introduced. According to Stevenson, these improvements did not hike taxes a single cent. In terms of offensive campaigning, Stevenson asserted that Johnson was a new dealer at heart or simply politically unprincipled. If his new stance is on key issues like Cold War preparedness and labor union power and his complete disregard for balanced budgets, Johnson's board again conservatism reeked of inauthenticity to Mr. Texas. Finally, election day came on Saturday, July 24th, and the vote totals satisfied no candidate. With 1.2 million votes counted, Stevenson received 39.6% of the population, while Johnson received 33.7%, and Petty got a respectable 19.7%, just under 20. While Johnson did not manage to win the election, his current position was a Hail Mary from where he started. Since neither candidate had a real majority, the Democratic primary would have a runoff election between Lyndon Johnson and Koch Stevenson. On the night of the election, both Stevenson and Johnson would be on their way to Washington for different reasons. After seeing the results, Stevenson was worried the isolationist tag given to him by his opponents would push away petty voters in the runoff. He would quickly make a statement reiterating his non-isolationist views. We must live up to our responsibility to the rest of the world. Our fate is no longer separated from them. Johnson would continue playing the same tune of military preparedness, 
this time suggesting that Randolph Field should be turned into an Air Force Academy and adding additional war plans across the state. Stevenson was short of breath when asked to repeat his stance on Taft-Hartley, feeling as though his position was cemented. When reporters in Washington asked him to affirm his stance, Stevenson was impatient and told him to read the record. But no matter what you read, the Johnson campaign created so much doubt about Stevenson's loyalty to labor. An unwise move to badmouth the press, Coke Stevenson was renamed to Cake Stevenson by national reporters for his desire to have his cake and eat it too when it came to Taft-Hartley. Obviously, Stevenson did not have a change of heart in the last few weeks, but his refusal to clarify his position gave an opening to his enemies that he was a fence-sitter. After returning to Texas, Stevenson's first speech in the runoff campaign would be an explicit denunciation of labor endorsement, specifically the CIO. He said he'd rather not be elected at all if he meant he'd be reliant on their support, since the people of Texas do not deserve a politician who speaks out of two sides of his mouth. Johnson supporters in the press would still say Stevenson was a puppet of labor bosses as, quote, a willing whip with which to punish this courageous congressman at the ballot box. Stevenson would courageously respond by spending a week at his Kimball County ranch, shearing sheep and herding cattle. But August had begun and the runoff election date was August 28th. As Texas's proxy war of national politics raged on, the two candidates would enter a stick measuring contest of who is less of a communist, with the Taft-Hartley Act as a litmus test. Save for freedom is your chance and mine to fight communism. Join now by... Join now by... Join now by... Reading Johnson and Stevenson's speeches showed the banality of political rhetoric. On the same day, August 18th, both candidates would make speeches asserting that they were, quote, not a new recruit in the fight against communism. A few days later, the two would use the exact same simile in alleging that their opponent was spending money like water from the spring of corruption. Johnson would up the ante by doubling down on rumors that the, quote, labor bosses have loosed the biggest slush funded Texas history to defeat him. When Stevenson's friends expressed dismay at the unfounded allegations and, quote, mudslinging, Johnson would reply, his friends are alarmed, and the people of Texas are amused that this no platform, no stump speech, no mud slinging, easy going, cool calculating fellow should blow his top as soon as he comes around the bend. What did Johnson mean by blow his top? Well, Stevenson and his allies finally lost it, with the Dallas News as the primary medium. The newspaper would take Johnson to task for being a New Dealer in 1937 and a state's rightist in 1947. Now flip, flop, and fly. In addition, Stevenson would take notice of the fake news being pervaded in the Johnson Journal, terming it a, quote, smear sheet. The Dallas News would continue their jockeying by proclaiming that Johnson was motivated by self-interest and the fervor of the uninformed. Johnson rushed out half-baked views to gain the approval of the audience with no overriding philosophy or principle. On August 26, two days before the election, the two candidates would arrive to town in their true respective fashions. Johnson would be celebrating his 40th birthday by demanding a police escort and a street parade. Ex-Governor Stevenson would arrive in his old Plymouth without much notice or fanfare to shake hands with citizens and officials at the Dallas County Courthouse. On the eve of the election, Stevenson would return to his Kimball County ranch to be surrounded by his friends and family. They would say that his conversations would revolve around his livestock, pecan trees, or overgrown cedar trees. As for Johnson, he would return to Austin to follow election results in his backyard. Unbeknownst to him, his wife, Lady Bird Johnson, who is credited for many of these home movies for which I am very grateful for, suffered a car crash the previous day. While bruised, Mrs. Johnson did not want to distract her husband from one of the biggest days of his life. But what ensue is one of the most chaotic episodes of American electoral history. As the clock struck midnight on August 28, 1948, the two hopefuls were neck and neck. Stevenson held a small lead with 470,681 votes to Johnson's 468,787. By noon the next morning, Johnson had jumped to a 629 vote lead on the back of a massive vote surge from Duval County, with 4,195 votes to Johnson and only 38 to his opponent. This news particularly irked Stevenson as Duval County was famously under the political machine of George Parr, a good friend of Johnson. Stevenson urged his supporters to monitor the election results, and even the head of the Texas Election Bureau, Robert Johnson, called for extra scrutiny in a razor-thin election possibly decided by only a hundred or fewer votes. When Monday morning rolled around, the candidates awoke to Stevenson holding a 119-vote lead with 400 votes awaiting tabulation. Previous elections usually had been reported on election night, but Jim Wells County only began reporting votes by Sunday morning. 
On Sunday night, county officials speculated that a batch of votes went missing. The following Monday, George Parr, the political boss of Jim Wells County, instructed election judge Luis Parras to hold back the official total for Box 13 until after vote total corrections were reported in the other counties first. By September 2nd, five days after the election, Stevenson appeared to lead by 349 votes, with only 40 votes left to count, according to the state election board. Vote count corrections on Thursday would remove 121 votes from Stevenson and award Johnson 115 votes. This left Stevenson with a mere 113 vote lead. Finally, on Friday, September 3rd, 1948, six days after the polls had closed, Jim Wells County Judge Luis Salas picks up the phone to report 202 late election ballots in Box 13. 200 of 202 ballots were in Lyndon Johnson's favor. Johnson immediately declared victory with a vote lead of 87. The final total was Johnson's 494,191 and Stevenson's 494,104. Being already suspicious, Stevenson would not take this laying down and on September 10th would call for an investigation into election integrity, specifically for those 202 votes from Alice in Duval County. Stevenson maintained that the votes produced in Precinct 13 were as a result of fraud and should be thrown out. Johnson would obtain a temporary restraining order in the 126th District Court to prevent Jim Wells County from certifying new election results to the state committee. Injunction be damned, Stevenson paid a visit to Alice Bank alongside Frank Hamer the famed Texas Ranger responsible for the ambush that killed Bonnie and Clyde. The two met up with Harry Lee Adams, the new Democratic Committee chairman who convinced his predecessor to allow the men to see the Box 13 poll list. The three of them were only given five minutes to look at the list before they were kicked out. In spite of its brevity, the investigation created more doubt about the vote's legitimacy. All 202 of the voters voted in alphabetical order, all voted in the last 15 minutes before the polls closed, the color of the ink was different from all the other ballots, and all contained identical handwriting. No matter how good the evidence could be, Stevenson wasn't going to win the Democratic nomination in a courtroom in a few weeks. The last frontier for both candidates was getting the election certified by the State Democratic Executive Committee. The SDEC was a 50-50 split between Johnson and Stevenson supporters, with many of them appointed by Stevenson himself as governor. Miriam Ma Ferguson, the first female governor of Texas and a legendary figure by this point, was crucial in convincing committee members to convene in Fort Worth to certify the election. In that room, the tension in the air was palpable. Immediately, arguments sprung between Stevenson and Johnson supporters. Stevenson's attorneys sh shouted that he was there to prevent the stuffing of the ballot box. John Kofer, a Johnson supporter, replied, You are not going to deprive of this election on the affidavits from a few Mexicans. The first 10 votes alternated between the candidates, but then Stevenson gained 10 votes in a row, followed by the next consecutive votes going to Johnson. By the end, it was 29 to 27 in Johnson's favor, but then a woman on the committee changed her vote from LBJ to Stevenson, creating a tie at 28-28. In the case of a tie, Chairman Robert Calvert, who presided over the vote would be the tiebreaker. Calvert made a call to action for all non-voting delegates and as he lifted his gavel to end the motion and bring the vote into his hands, time and history would freeze. Close by, Charlie Gibson, a delegate from Amarillo, was in a nearby hotel heading for the upstairs men's room, feeling sick from one too many drinks. Sam Houston Johnson, Lyndon Johnson's brother, spotted the wobbly delegate and followed him up the stairs where he found Charlie with his head dunked into the sink. Johnson's brother immediately manhandled the unsuspecting delegate and dragged him to the committee room. Gibson was pushed through the loud and raucous crowd and hearing Chairman Calvert's final call to non-voting delegates and being unable to get his attention, Houston made Gibson stand on a chair to yell out his yay vote for Johnson. Landslide Linden had finally won. Stevenson, furious with this outcome, would notch his final arrow by foregoing his state's rights philosophy and appealing to federal courts to overturn the election. The case would reach Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black's desk, who was in charge of overseeing matters in the Fifth Circuit. Johnson's longtime friend and legend in American law, Abe Fortas, argued and won in preventing the overturning of the election. Justice Black would maintain the constitutional principle that elections were state matters and that the Stevenson campaign's allegations of civil rights violations were insufficient. Johnson would go on to defeat Republican Jack Porter in the general election and, well, the rest is history. And political science. In 1986, in a mobile home in Houston, Texas, an 84-year-old skinny white-haired Mexican gentleman is seeking peace of mind before he passes on as he is given only 11 months left to live. 
Luis Indio Salas, the election general in Jim Wells County in 1948, sits down with Robert Caro, LBJ's chief biographer. He says George Pars met with him and others after the election day was over and the first tally of votes had been counted. As Parr read names off the voter registration list, Salas was responsible for checking if they had voted or not. If not, Salas would add their names to the Johnson vote tally, giving an ample explanation to the 200 votes alphabetical order. When asked why he lied in testimonies about the legitimacy of the election, Salas replied, I was just going along with my party. 42 years later and after the release of Robert Caro's historical bombshell, Means of Ascent, the New York Times would flatly admit that Johnson had stolen the election. Now time for some reflection. Now make no mistake, LBJ clearly cheated and he cheated spectacularly. But he also campaigned spectacularly as well. And this relates to voter mobilization and how the Johnson campaign galvanized an impressive turnout. While Johnson toiled endlessly for months, traveling by a helicopter, creating giveaways, local shows, and spectacles all across the Lone Star State, Stevenson spent weeks at a time making overtures to his livestock and working on his farm rather than on the campaign stump. The sharp contrast and perceived enthusiasm bled into the polls results in the turnoff. An estimated 113,523 voters who had cast ballots for Stevenson in the first primary did not vote in the runoff. This compared to only 4,054 for Johnson. For a candidate that only lost by 87, that statement probably hurts to hear. In addition, 90% of voters who only voted in the runoff voted for Johnson. The Stevenson campaign seemed to be completely ineffective in upholding morale against a barrage of Johnson campaign assaults in the media and in the townhouse. In two West Texas counties, Hansford and Kinney, which had voted 3-1 to one and 2-1 to one, respectively for Stevenson in the primary, had not even decided to hold the runoff election, with local Stevenson supporters believing their support to be too insignificant to their candidate's margin of victory. It is estimated that had calculating Coke Stevenson's galvanized the supporters to the degree of that of Landslide Linden, he would have won by over 100,000 votes, an indisputable margin. As far as vote manipulation is concerned, the main Johnson camp argument was and is that fraud occurred everywhere and that Stevenson stole votes as well. And this claim, while not a glowing endorsement of Johnson, is not entirely untrue. After all, Stevenson won the vote in Jim Wells County in the past five elections when it was run by the same political boss, and block voting with entire counties voting unanimously for one candidate were clear indications of voter manipulation. Vote switching was the primary means of vote manipulation. It was much easier to switch votes from one candidate to another than it was to synthesize new votes. Miriam Ma Ferguson was supporting the Johnson campaign, and given her clout in Texas politics, she had the ears of many election judges across Texas on election night. She was instrumental in Johnson's victory as she would call party bosses to convince them to switch votes over to Johnson or deny telling Stevenson their correct vote tallies so they would think that they were more ahead than they actually were. In the era of political machines, the one who counted the votes usually decided who the winner was. As far as you kids are concerned, let's just say that this isn't the last time you'll see LBJ, but you might see him when you're a little bit older. Raising the monthly draft call. Anyways, I hope you all like the good jungle countryside. <laughs>